um, through, the, through the review, but also its wider context and with some focus on, on how the Academy in particular <coughs> might uh, add its energy to uh, implementing uh, some of the recommendations. Now, I've got, um, I've got my own views of, uh, of how we might best best help, but this afternoon is really an opportunity for, for you to reflect on, uh, on the review, what you've heard from, from, from Terry, and look forward your ideas as to the way in which you think the Academy might, might best help to, to implement the, the, the ideas of, of, of place um, that, uh, that Terry's been, been talking about. Any questions or, or comments? First one over there. Yes, just, just to pick up on this question about place leadership council, how do you see that working in a, a large city? So I'm speaking from a Birmingham perspective. And there are two <coughs> thoughts in my mind. Now, one is, what is the role of the local economic partnership? Oh, the local economic partnership within that context, is that too institutionally driven? Because in, at the moment, the LECs don't really engage with the community level. So there's an issue there. But yet they are increasingly becoming much more involved in the planning process and determining the future of that area. And then the second part of that is what happens to the local authority planning committee? Because the planning committees are so driven by the pure legalistic process of the planning acts. And they are so scared of making what they see as a wrong decision for their city in case they are brought to appeal by an applicant. Now, if we're talking about real place development, actually the cities need to grab back the powers that the planning acts have nationally. And I'd be really interested as to how a place leadership council could be a mechanism where the cities can have devolved powers from the national planning acts to actually create proper places without it being second guessed by someone else down in London. <laughs> I think you've answered a lot of your own questions. And I think that um, all of my audiences have been for 20 to 30 years is that um, we do not have a culture of planning in this country. We call it planning, it's actually development control. We've now rebranded it as, as, as development management. But until it is truly uh, proactive, um, then it will never be planned and never earn that name. You know, I went as a result of doing the review to a uh, parliamentary um, uh, select committee, which I attended as a board in South Washington, I'll tell you, but I've never been there uh, in, my, in my own uh, as, a, as a witness or the evidence. I was trying to wear about 12 and I, I began to realize that there's a real cultural problem because they didn't know what I meant. They didn't know the animal, they didn't know the beast. Uh, I remember someone saying, oh, until you've had a curry, you don't know, you can't describe it to someone else. And I think it's true of planet. You don't, you don't actually, they, they thought we had planet development control and what's more, there are, uh, there are, there are plan makers, plan making goes on. Uh, and uh, I, I just think you have to look at where planning really does work. And, and the city of Birmingham and Manchester uh, have, have realised and are doing a lot of genuine private planning. If somebody says, why is the ring road there in Birmingham? We will only got an underpass to worry about. You've got a ring road, and so are many other towns have got ring roads. I used to know Huntington very well. Why is the ring road there? And, and the answers are um, that actually they were an idea that they solved certain problems, but they created other problems that made the other if the problem you had in the first place seem quite trivial. Uh, and so you. Uh, Proactive plan does things like saying, why is there a ring road? But development control doesn't do that. 
Well, the planning committee never sits down. And, and indeed, I've seen many a city in my hometown of Newcastle where uh, there's been a building looking onto the hay market that was on my master plan. And I argue there ought to be a, one of the university buildings sitting on the hay market because it is all, the university has always been the back lines and they needed to come make a presence on the front of the city itself. There were so many problems with planning consent. And we went back to committee, it got refused, we got consultants <coughs> in, it changed architect. And in the meantime, the whole of the hay market was torn up, the pedestrian crossings were moved, <coughs> the railings were put up, the street lights and the width of the road was changed without any consultation with anybody anywhere, and actually had a far more dramatic effect upon Newcastle than this one building did. But, but, but the building is answering the question as set, i.e. there's a birth control system and all new buildings need to go before that. And actually, not, not a building go before development control. I don't think we realise how few of them go through the development control uh, process. There are an awful lot in various institutions, a lot of transport projects don't go through and so on. So I, I, the answer is we need proactive, creative planning. But nobody quite knows what we mean by that. Nick Bulls was going to um, uh, lead on a conference on that, and I said, so what have we done? He made, he made an interesting quote, uh, he was very enthusiastic indeed about uh, neighborhood plans. And he said there have been 19 of them, and so far I've gone to referendum. And he said that in almost every case, um, when they, they, they linked it to the referendum as, as far as they could, to council, uh, council elections, so that they didn't have to ask them to go in twice. So, and, uh, and more people went in and ticked the boxes and answered the questions for the for the um, uh, uh, for the neighbourhood plans than actually voted for councillors. <laughs> An awful lot of them just left the room having done the, the neighbourhood plan bit, filled that out, and didn't bother with council votes. That's really interesting. That really, it shows that as a result, is proactive plan. I think the, 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 the ability for local authorities to undertake active planning through the, the what happens before development control or development management is, is going to be increasingly important because the reason, and I'm speaking as a, as a planner and an ex-local authority planner, the reason why it's, it's, it's the way that it is now is because the reduction in funding for local authorities has attracted that, that, that plan making capability, that master planning capability which local authorities used to have. So in, in Terry's diagram here, top down and bottom up, in, in that position there are the local planning authorities. And they're in an impossible position at the moment because they don't have the resources to manage that flow of bottom up and top down uh, planning that, um, that, well, that needs I, to happen. I, I have to say though that there are so many more people that are planners And I don't think they have to be local authority planners. I was interested in New York, the way they set the roses and so They hire uh, they hire consultant planners and consultant architects to do that. So I think uh, there's a lot, a lot of expertise. You don't have to build a No, no, no there's, there's, there's plenty of us around. It's uh, whether the local authorities can afford to afford to buy us. Now I'm going to go <laughs> there next and then to Steve and then to Richard and then I'll catch everybody eventually. So Terry, thank you for a most wonderfully inspirational and thought-provoking uh, canter, as you put it. Um, I, I feel yeah, I very much agree with the point you were, you, you were making just now, but I also very much follow on from that original, the original question because I feel so much does lie with the planning committee as well. But I notice that the thing that makes me bridge into them is your first point, your first section of the review, and that is education. And I believe that not only do we need uh, greater funding and, the, and all the other things we mentioned for planning, for planners, the planning committee, we need them to understand far more what all this is about, because places are for people, and people are human beings, part of the animal kingdom, with all the, uh, the means that we know that they have in, 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 in uh, real technical 
um, financial and all other terms, but they also have a thing called the spirit and the heart. And I often, when I'm talking about buildings, say that we need to create buildings almost as the ultimate clothes they wear that are fit for the purpose for which they are built. Now, I believe we can extend that one degree forward and say places are for people, communities, and they have an extension of those needs in the greater place to serve their real needs. And you will join wonderful comparisons with <coughs> things that have been done very often for major engineering uh, to, to fulfill perceived engineering needs, which usually are very often unfamiliar. Uh, and having worked closely with the Prince's Foundation, with them, and they for me on various projects, I've come very much to this feeling that we need to get far closer to the real inner as well as outer needs of people. And therefore, help planning committees understand what they should really be all about. And I know on this subject of education, I recently had to take forward a major, um, a, a, a major project for a plant. Uh, that was essentially <coughs> built on the ultimate need for it to be super sustainable, super energy efficient. In fact, it was totally autonomous, a very, quite a major project. Uh, and to my delight, we were, we were voted through by the planning committee 13 to 1. But the reason that happened was because I actually took them to an exemplar project that actually described what we were about. And they never believed that it was possible to create a place that was so autonomous. And that worked. And when they saw the example, they could see it had been working for over a decade or more since it was created, exactly as I was proposing. How do we get over this? Well, uh, we, we made a big uh, of the review of education. But we distinguish very much between the different types of education in the world, well, definitely schools. We do need uh, school children to be aware of the disregard. They actually are already. They are very much more clued up than they were 30, 40, 50 years ago. The environment, sustainability, they don't call it that, but actually uh, it, it's very important. But we need to get we need to get practice, practi practitioners, we need to get landscapers and architects. I don't <coughs> think we start off with the funding. I think we start off uh, with looking at what the need is and how to develop it. Uh, and the answer to that. Uh, I think those education professions, I think there are various proposals there, like uh, there are often many schools of architecture, more schools of architecture in the first year that is the foundation year. So that you can actually have landscapes and mixed up with transport and mixed up with politics. But I do think adult education, particularly the education we made of the girls in the interview, that um, to be on the planning committee, I know this is the case because the mothers have to, but we need there to be a degree of um, uh, in, informed, uh, informed um, practice by the part of those that are on the planning. If you're going to be on the finance committee or the legal committee, you have to go through various courses before you can be on those committees. And, and I think basically uh, you can't have to be on the committee, you can't read plans. You know, if you've got to prove the plans because it's not been to you, you have the benefit of going in to show them something, but very often you can't show them something because it doesn't exist or it's not clear enough. You talk, Terry, about uh, literacy um, and helping people to be to, to articulate more clearly their, their expectations and aspirations for the places that they, they're interested in. And I think the work that the Academy does, particularly with our assessment visits, in, in engaging with the various interests that have made these places the, the success that they are, not only gives them the opportunity to explain to them why they think that they're great, it gives us an opportunity to articulate our involvement in a way which they, which they can understand. I think the danger is that, that the more that we talk together as professionals, the more we understand each other, but the more we get stuck in the professional trap lines, as you, were, as, you, as you were describing, rather than being able to explain and respond to 
uh, the <coughs> language, the lingua franca that's used by those who have a particular interest in a particular location, and that may be a, an area in the context of urban areas where we may be able to, to help. Um, Steve, now. Yeah, picking up again on, on the education side. I'm just, just thinking in relation to planning committees, translation of planning committees, um, what planning committee members do get some training in is the development control side of it, the, the, the legal side. But they get no training in urbanism or in planning. Um, I'm not sure one or two will be able to inadvertently do something, but there's no requirement to do so. So I think that's, that's definitely a big issue for us to, to look at jointly. And the other end of that, I think of the generational aspects. Um, we, we, the practice uh, that I'm with, um, we've been doing more work recently, especially in Barbados, um, working amongst others with um, groups of quite young children there, say eight, nine, ten, uh, getting them to look at their places and to tell us what they feel about. And they have such a clarity of understanding the place that they know, and they know it in great detail, but it seems to almost get driven out of people by the education system. And I, I think we need to, to really get in at that young age and then keep it going, and I think we know it better, because there's almost an inbuilt uh, appreciation of place there, that I think there's, there's a danger or it gets, gets educated out of people. It's about what they're capable of doing. Start off with people who think we managed to knock that out by the time they get to the end of school. And I think it was a real opportunity for them to do that. Liam Crear used to say he was the best qualified architect in, uh, in Great Britain because he had never been damaged by architecture school. <laughs> <laughs> I think the victorious altar um, came up with uh, a concept that I am quite thought through. I think it's around, which is not the only one talking about, which is that. Rather than have a course called planning or place or architecture, we need to embed it in physics, in biology, and in all different subjects. And I think I would go along with that because it's a bit like if you have a silo, it, uh, it, you know, as a, I think it's a disadvantage sometimes to have a silo as a, as a, as a political department. I think there's something about, about disaggregation but it places the onus then about connectivity. And I think today it's all about connectivity, whether it's railway stations, airports, or, or courses at, uh, at the primary school or secondary school. I think it's all about <coughs> don't be afraid of disaggregation because that's the world we're in. Uh, but work very, very hard. Uh, Richard, yeah, I'd like to say first, so I'm available to work in Barbados. <laughs> um, thank you. <laughs> um, Terry, I'd like to have a look at your base as, as to what the Academy might actually do. Um, and one of the, the many things on which Cable English Heritage spoke with one voice was something called the Open Panel, uh, which actually the, the Academy has kind of evolved, I think, to some extent, through uh, its diagnostic places. Basically, it was a joint K heritage team would go into the town, look at the issues and come up with a, a, a report about what was necessary. Um, now I think um, you've actually hit the nail on the head in, in a way when you talk about how historic towns can change. We, we've got lots of experience and knowledge about how to change individual historic buildings. And I think of things like the new refectory of Norwich Cathedral, which is a modern building but perfectly comfortable with the cathedral. We're much less clear, I think, of how will we evolve and change historic towns? And the historic towns forms have lots of good work, I think. I think one thing the Academy might think about, given our breadth of experience, our international understanding, is whether we could come up with something which would help people to understand ways of evolving and changing historic towns in a more systematic way. And English heritage has got huge experience on buildings and through things like the Academy and towns. Maybe we could think about something uh, as we go forward with <coughs> our program that would actually provide more guidance and support on that. Well, I, I was proposing that you uh, not work with heritage, but you direct your attention to the non-historic towns, because it's not either or anymore. And even at the debate that I was at Ken Wood, they said you can't solve Lincoln without solving Slough. 
if you're going to say not no extra housing at Lincoln, which is what they were saying, that place is an issue <coughs> burden on some other town. How do you solve those towns? And how do you and what does historically this uh, people that live there? hundred years ago is a long time and their granddads and grandmothers were there and uh, I think we're building history all the time. And so yes. uh, I think I think I'm not sorry just to, to come back to that. I absolutely agree with you about that. Uh, Cave was actually mocked at one point for producing a piece called Ordinary Places. And we were scoffed at by architects for trying to talk about how ordinary places could be improved. Literally scoffed at, I was laughed at. Um, so, but I think also, I'm not sure why Lincoln should be let off or New York. Um, from, from, I mean, the rest of the, you know, just because Lincoln is old and has got a piece of historic centre, uh, why should more people not be allowed to go and live there? So I, I think actually we could do both. Um, but I just didn't want to miss the point that actually. Yeah, our expertise on expanding historic towns is still, I think, quite weak. But I think what I want to stop happening is English heritage thinking of themselves in the words of a uh, former chairman as the organisation that likes to say no. Uh, <laughs> and I think to set up a historic town sounds like a set up to say no to, 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 to the tech. Yeah. It has to be seen as all one problem. It has to I be seen as. Yeah, I'm not saying <coughs> to the technique of I'm saying, how do you solve the two, not just the one? Well, I think you must have expertise. Yes, well, I've, I've, I've spent much of my time in charity trying to break down, trying to remove the concept of the historic environment as something separate. Uh, but actually, we live in an environment, some of which is more historic than others, but everything around us is historic to some degree. And we established heritage values as a means of, uh, of more objectively uh, evaluating what it was about that was historically significant, whether it's 10 years old or, uh, or 1,000 years old. Indeed, uh, what was being listed in the 1940s and 50s is not what's being listed now. Uh, it's very uh, questions have changed about what is, what is valuable. Yeah, yeah well, we've just seen Tecton and uh, Simex headquarters uh, listed in the 1990s. Uh, I'm beginning to lose track of who was next. I think there was one here. Who was next? Yes, uh, Dave Waterhouse, Cape and Design Council. I, like you, and Terry, have the privilege of giving evidence on Monday to the ECRCOP Select Committee on the effectiveness of national planning policy framework. And one of the things that I said there very clearly was the need for mandatory training for councillors uh, in urban design, in place making, uh, and those teams respond to that very well. Uh, the other thing, of course, is this whole thing about proactive planning and getting in place a proactive vision of the local plan. Um, we only have less than 50% of authorities with a local plan in place. And I do think there's something there about the skills and role of local authorities at the very top to get in place a functioning local plan. And then above that, there is a strategic planning deficit. We don't have a regional planning system uh, in place anymore. And actually, some of these decisions about larger than local need to be taken at that sub regional uh, scale. Some of us have just come from the TCPA. <coughs> very debate this afternoon, so I think it's all very timely. Uh, just on the KEH point, um, we are producing joint guidance with English Heritage on tall buildings, and that is being undertaken as we speak uh, with English Heritage. So I think there's a good model there for joint work here, but on which from KEH's perspective, we would welcome uh, a continuation of it. Yes, I mean, we have been a long now, but uh, English Heritage having a statutory protection of setting a list of buildings in a place like London. But the setting of a list of buildings is from the, everywhere inside the M25. And, uh, so what does it mean when you say that that view or that setting is, uh, is, is harmed? But you can't actually have the same authority about, well, is it right anyway? You know, you have to think of it, you have to think of it all in as well. Yes, okay, um, there's still lots of hands to, to, to go. I'm going to go to that one next, yes, well, and, and there are drinks on the roof at uh, half past as well. So, more than the most recent book, I assume it's the most recent book, published earlier this year, um, City as a Tangled Plan. Who's it aimed at? Uh, well, um, I had to write, as you do in that series, uh, you have to write at who it is aimed at, and uh, publishing
publishers there uh, wanted me to aim it at uh, urban planning for students. That's what it said in the... Uh, but I just thought it, it is written um, from a big picture. And I just wonder if it's an ideal book for compulsory for planners to read. Compulsory for planning committees to read. Compulsory in, in, um, as, a, as a foundation in, in more than just planning. Well, I, I, I would like to think that's the case. Uh, I didn't think long and hard enough about the title because um, uh, I took it from Darwin's uh, yeah. last part of his big book. And he said, if you look at the tangle back, uh, it doesn't seem to be any order. And what he was making the point is that order isn't necessarily a visual order. The tangle bank is full of all kinds of chaos. But he then ends up by saying, there is grandeur in this, greater grandeur in this. And in fact, actually, the, the grandeur of ecology is far greater than we can ever conceive of. And I, I was arguing that it's urban evolution. It makes all kinds of urban, urban design uh, alone, or harder. But a lot of people uh, took the title, The Cities of Hangar Bank, to be about the financial crisis. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to take three more, um, and I'm going to choose less familiar faces. <coughs> Frequent faces will forgive me. So, uh, gentlemen here. Uh, yeah, well, oh, thank you. I have spoken already. I'm Ted. I live in Bristol. Um, I'm, I'm kind of aware, to me, it seems, not being a design person, a planner or an architect, that this diagram and some of the discussion that's followed has taken to, uh, in a way, uh, limit the scope of what councils and councillors do. So we've, 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 when we mention council, we talk about planning and development control. Actually, councillors are representatives of their communities in in, you know, as a corporate body, looking after the whole place insofar as they're allowed to by government devolution of powers. So if we really want local leadership to take control over and take leadership of the place, then we need to argue that local leadership needs to be empowered to do so and be held accountable for its powers. At the moment, councils get blamed for everything that goes wrong, but they don't have the power to make sure that things go right, and therefore they don't have the responsibility to make sure and to work effectively like that, in, in that way. I, 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 to be true, I mean, we have to recognise that councils on development control often sit on other committees, they do other things, and they move from one committee to another. So we just don't want to just focus on them, we want to focus on how the city works and work with, with politicians and officers as teams rather than just try a blame game and say, we've missed them out there because they're not important. Actually, they are important, and they will always be seen by people as important. The other people that I think are missing in this are the, the, are the finances, where the sources of finance are. Um, we do actually make our plans and our master plans as we can do. We hope that they're viable, we hope that someone will invest in them, and we are disappointed when they're not invested in them, the way that we design them, the way we conceptualise them. So we do need to um, work with finance, Maybe we need to work with finance to understand better what their return on investment is. And maybe, as a nation, we could be also working in ways in which we can get return on investment that supports placemaking, as well as simply um, uh, export <coughs> capital, etc. I think there's two things that, are, uh, you know, that, 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 that flow from that. One is the stewardship, because return on investment is, is a short-term way of saying who's going to be the gainer, who's the customer, of the design, and who's going to take responsibility for how a place stays sustainable, stays enjoyable, can flex, can be, can, can you know, work in 20 years' time. It's very few of us thinking about. You know, I live in a place that was quite culturally redesigned or redeveloped 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Uh, I don't know whether anybody thought what we were going to be like in 30 years' time. They thought we had a good design now. The return on investment happened in that short time. So I think there's something about making sure that we can affects the, the uh, finances so that there can be better long-term partners of what we want to achieve in terms of place. I hope that makes some sense. The important strength of, of, of local democracy, which may, be, you know, may, may feel has been undermined. Yes, yeah, so, A lot of the work we do, um, 
is about public engagement, and everyone has been speaking about this here, about the importance of it, and the has set up this community initiative today. The problem is that the world is changing very fast, and even one generation from another has different ideas, technology is completely transforming our lives. And are we in danger of being a little bit too certain of ourselves? And shouldn't we actually be building in uncertainty into place? Um, I've done a lot of work with the freight industry recently. In 20 years, the whole way in which that operates is changing from you know, the West Midlands full of sheds to port-centric manufacturing. And the good thing about the freight industry is those big warehouses can be pulled down almost overnight. Yet here we are talking about heritage and hundreds of years, and it's a really little bit of a danger that we're getting a bit above ourselves. That's a good point, but perhaps not one for discussion now. But maybe <laughs> we, we can develop that in debate on the um, on the uh, room on, on, on the website. Um, yes, fine. <laughs> I was just going to say that listening to, to the debate, my re response to the review was more revolutionary. There was talk earlier about almost this uh, utopia where suddenly local authorities would get more funding and they'd be able to do more proactive planning. That's never going to happen. So they're not going to get more funding. They're not going to be able to do that top-down uh, planning. Somehow or other, we need to get that independent voice working because there's no monopoly of ideas within local authorities on how things should happen. And perhaps we as an academy can try and foster some examples of place leadership where we can actually say, yeah, you, you'll never do this as a local authority. You can't do it tomorrow. You're not going to have the funding probably in five or ten years' time. And who says you're right anyway? So an independent voice that goes over time and develops is something that perhaps we could foster and, and I think it's a bit more revolutionary and realistic as well. Well, I, I, I'm not sure what you're saying. I, I meant by proactive planning. Yes. Therefore, you should have more <coughs> local authority plans. No, I, I didn't think you were. I, I think some of the response was, if only we had more funding, we could do it that way. I, I, I would argue not the opposite necessarily, but right now, at Aldo Com, there is a huge enterprise going on. Uh, and it's, it's talk of uh, 20,000 homes, and university campuses, new football stadiums. If uh, the actual plan for HS2 was to act as a the brief that went out was to have a railway station with no doors because there's nobody living there and, we'll <laughs> and the only door was connecting to Crossrail because the, the, the transportation believed the, that they couldn't get them all into Houston. So they need to get a third of them off onto Crossroad. So the only door, and the only reason for a station was that. But in doing, in putting Crossrail and HS2 there, you've created the most accessible place in Britain. <laughs> With land around it, the, the taxpayer owns. It's all railway land. And it's, it, it's, I don't know how many hectares it is, but it's vast. Uh, and it's very close in. It's as close to London centre as the rest of the shopping centres. Well, thank you for asking that question at the end, because of course leadership is one of the things that, that keeps bubbling up on our assessment visits and our diagnostic uh, exercises as being one of the things that's key to, uh, to, su to successful places and may, may well be one of the things that we can help um, through, the, through, the, uh, through the reviews place. Uh, initiative to, to develop further with um, the Sotarian and his team. Um, I'm sorry if I haven't been able to uh, give everybody the opportunity to, to ask a point or raise a question, but it has been a very lively, uh, fruitful discussion that we will continue in, in, in different forms in, in, in the future and that will shape uh, the activities that we develop um, in, the, in the years to come. But in the meantime, Sotarian, thank you very much.